Good evening. Thank you all for coming out early and on time. It's really bright in here, bro. Half of my bio is Bo's bio as well. We've traveled together uh, from New York City poetry stages to yeah. <laughs> where he's about to take you this evening. So um, I feel like everybody, I'm not going to read the bio, the bio is here, the bio is everywhere. Most bios are wrong anyway. Whatever he said to him has probably changed by now. And I'm really hoping the bio will change even more after this evening. So I will be here available for questions from me and from you. But um, what I hope most for this evening for him is an opportunity to move through what he needs to move through as an artist. And I'm going to ask him about his own personal myth making. And be careful because I might ask you about your own. It's that kind of night, and this is Bosia. Cyanide poisoning. When I get the money, I'm going to publish 382 page books with nothing. 
nothing but my name on the cover, and people will buy them. And I'm gonna have benefit concerts where I sing everyone else's songs really badly. And I'm gonna eat barbecued Smurf every day. And I'm gonna reveal to the world that Jerry Springer's really Oprah Winfrey in disguise. And I'm gonna get an incurable cancer and cure by applying a salve made out of the breast tissue of Gloria Estefan. When I get the money, I'm gonna buy all of the baby kittens in the world, eagerly awaiting the second coming of Alf. When I get the money, Thursday will be renamed Half Sex with Bo Sia Day. And Doggy Sal will henceforth be known as Bo Style. When I get the money, the actors from The Breakfast Club are gonna come over and watch the movie with me and they'll have to listen to me say repeatedly, wow, I really thought your careers would take off after that. When I get the money, I'm gonna throw my weight around. When I get the money, I'm gonna use people. When I get the money, I'm gonna own MTV. And sure, money can't buy you love, but love can't buy you shit. <laughs> Tonight, I'm gonna to recite seven poems that I'm most known for. I wrote that when I was 18, performed at the New York Poets Cafe to win my first poetry slam to get me on the New York Poets Cafe slam team in 1996. And uh, you can only imagine what a struggle it was like to just recite that poem in as close to the voice that I used at 18 as possible. It's 1997, I spent a summer at NYU, started watching a lot of Woody Allen movies, feeling very low, very isolated, very misunderstood. Did I go out and meet the world? No, I wrote this. <laughs> Love. The original version, no less, because Bob was the first that heard it. I think love is the most beautiful thing in the world. And I don't give a fuck. I have no original ideas. I'm a pathetic man whose goal is to read poetry to get women to fall in love with him. And you think I was romantic myself and revealing my horrible dark side by saying that, but I was really saying, women who hear this, fall in love with me or else. Because that's what it comes down to, an ultimatum, life or death. And sure, maybe I'm being extreme, but you tell me that things aren't extreme. Jesus, I've seen a man jack off to a gap window display, so don't tell me that love isn't important. And maybe you didn't get those lines. That's okay. Most of them are subtext designed to impress people who know too much about art. All you really need to listen to is the 12% which contain words like fuck and ass and ride my dumb stick, you naughty schoolgirl. Because in a poem about love, we all need to know the relevant things because we're all looking for the complete definition of love. If only we could open up our Encyclopedia Britannica and look up love and know, but love isn't that easy. They say Cupid loved my so-called life, and when the show was canceled, Cupid cried and cried and cried and decided that he was going to fuck up all of humanity. And this is why China has trouble with its birth rate, and Arkansas rhymes with date rape, and Iraq is Iraq, and the fat label sucked out of California could be its own island. But this isn't a poem about geography. This is a poem about love, the bane of my existence, the reason why I hate Valentine's Day and Halloween, and yes, Halloween is about trick-or-treating and children costumes and egging the houses of your enemies, but Halloween is also about ghosts. And I think you know where I'm going here. I'm going to the land of girlfriends of Halloween's past. And maybe I've only got three ghosts in this land, but this doesn't mean that they don't bring their friends or the ghosts of girls who rejected me, because girls rarely travel alone in this land. Lydia's from this land. I used to kiss her while listening to the cures just like heaven. Now I don't see her anymore, so that song makes me sad. Why must we associate music with our love lives? I'm not trying to be profound here. I'm just saying that music really takes me back, way back, and I can't explain the memory process involved in that because I'm not a psychology major. And maybe my problem with picking up women has to do with me always asking them, hey, what's your major? <laughs> but that only makes me as cheesy as 90% of the guys looking for women and 86% of them have been, so what's the deal here? Maybe I shouldn't think of women in terms of picking them up, and maybe I should open up my sensitive side, but really, the sensitive side sucks. I've been there. You can only imagine the kinds of sweaters they make you wear. It's not fair. Love is not fair, and war is not fair, and I don't care what anyone has to say about any of that. I'm sad in this world, and I feel unloved. I'm sorry that I need people to tell me I'm cool. I'm just that way. Aren't you? Am I the only one? I know that I can't be that misunderstood. I know that there have to be similarities between me and you because love is fun numerous award-winning moves in 12-step programs. My parents went to a 12-step program. It was called How to Be Married and Wish That You Were Divorced All the Time. They graduated first in their class. I was at their graduation. They forgot to go to mine. Do those lines have anything to do with this poem? No. That's part of the 88% that only smart people who think that subtext is cool should listen to. What you want to know is the part where I talk about my small dick again, because the Asian man will always be playing
plagued by this rumor until he's brave enough to whip it out on stage and say, ah, we are gigantic. <laughs> Honestly, this is not the direction I wanted to take this poem. <laughs> I just want to be in the arms of my true love. In a house, in a room, in a wonderful, perfect world with our two children, a boy and a girl, Helga and Lamar, but maybe I shouldn't have said this. Woody Allen taught us that marriage is the death trap. I'm almost as old as his girlfriend. She could be the long-lost sister I've been looking for. Maybe my mother gave her away when we lived in China. Wait, I never lived in China! I think I've begun lying in this poem. This is causing me to lose my purpose. I was hoping to talk about love for 4.1 minutes and then come to a conclusion somehow defining love within the poem. You see, my dream is to eventually be the Surat of poetry, meaning that every little world is just an insignificant, fucked up little dot on the page. But when you stand back when you look at it from afar and it's one big combination of insignificant fucked up little dots and everything becomes clear but is that what I'm doing? I don't have any answers and I'm looking for help from anyone because love has got me fucked up and died because I feel retarded without anyone to hold me and maybe that's sentimental but what's wrong with sentimental? I just need love. Fuck you! I'm okay! You see I can't even decide what I need much less understand what I'm saying. You see all I'm saying is someone love me. Holy fuck, this fucking time travel shit is hard. <laughs> Jesus. God, I can't wait till we get to the part where I learn how to modulate my voice and not fuck up my throat. <laughs> hey. God, you think going in the high register is easy? That shit is raw, dog. <laughs> Alright. This is how I get to be on the pilot episode of Deaf Poetry on HBO. An open letter to the entertainment industry. If there is anyone in the audience watching me perform tonight, regardless how you feel about the content or performance of my work, I want you to keep in mind that if you're casting any films, then you need a Korean grocery store owner, a computer expert, or the random thug of a Yakuza gang, that I'm your man. If you need a Chinese M&M, a Japanese Jay-Z, or a Vietnamese Timberlake, please consider me, because I'm all those things and more. I come from the house that step in fetches built, and I will broken English my way to sidekick status if that's what's expected of me. Make an Asian different strokes, and I'll walk around on my knees going, oh, what you talking about the weirdest? Because it's been 23 months and 14 days since my art has done anything for me. And I wouldn't be noble and toil on, I swear I would. Live for the art and the art alone and all that crap ass. But college loans are monthly out of my ass. My salmon teriyaki habit is getting way out of control. And I want some motherfucking cable. So you can understand where I'm coming from, right? When type first exhibiting dynamics within the text falls by the wayside and our culture rejoices in its pretty, packaged, boy, talentless jerk sent from Florida to make me puke, but I'm not preaching. No, sorry, boss. I cannot stress how ready I am to sell out, wear jiggy clothes, and yell from the top of my lungs any hook I am told to sing. If you want a caricature, I am that caricature. If you want an exotic dragon lady who fucks like a Kama Sutra come to life, just tell my ass where to go and I will bend over. If you need a voiceover artist, just tell Tell me where you want the high eyes, and I will be there, because I am all that and more. I'm a pop culture whore, I'm a co-sponsored world tour, and I'm an appropriated culture at my core. I've been noticed, acclaimed, and funny, and now all I want is a beachfront house to paint in, and a Range Rover to listen to my music in, because struggling fucking sucks hard after the ninth package of ramen noodle soup. I'm Bosia. Give me a chance, and I'll change the world. Crouch 
crouching tiger, hidden dragon, wasn't our one shot at love. This is the precursor of what's to come. Oh yeah, now it's cool to like these Asian people. As long as they stay Asian on the big screen, and it's set in Asia, and it's a long, long time ago, and they're doing Asian things, and they're speaking in Asian, thank God for subtitles. And who cares if they're kissing? As long as they're only kissing other Asians, you have nothing to worry about, right? Wrong, motherfucker! Because we're not just on the big screen and the kung fu flicks you adore. We are everywhere. We are programming your websites, making your executives look smart, and getting into your schools for free. Raise the bar and we'll meet it. And we're not just kissing other Asians. Oh, no. Our mad, sexy asses are getting play all over the ethnic spectrum. How the fuck do you think Tiger Woods, Rob Schneider, and Keanu Reeves were made? That's right. The Asian invasion is a reality, and we fuck so good. It's only gonna get bigger. Bigger than PlayStation 2, Taekwondo, Curry, Yoga, and Sister-in-Laws. You asked for a global economy? Well, so sorry if it blows up in your face and goes beyond getting a billion Chinese on AOL, eating KFC, and their Gap khakis. Am I ranting? Fuck yeah! And you're not shutting me up until the egg roll is recognized as an American food. So brothers and sisters, rise up! Let's give America the melting pot it's always talked about. And watch his hair gets darker, eyes get smaller, and everyone fucks that much better. <laughs> That same night, because you need three poems to win a slam, I wrote this on the train. I believe that a lot of people remember it the most because I repeat myself quite a bit. But hey, let's give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that because of the time period, they loved it for other reasons. <laughs> I'm so deep, my anus leaks the words of the prophet in the form of a fart. I'm so deep, the public swimming pool of my thoughts is all deep end. I'm so deep, pointing to my brain magnifies the value of what I say 327 fold. I'm so deep. The words I'm so deep aren't a hook. They're a mantra. I'm so deep. I'm the iceberg that let another iceberg sink the Titanic query. What does that metaphor mean? Answer. I'm too deep to give you the clues. When I say I'm deep like a pre-war communist, I'm deep like an exotic cheese spoken of loudly, or I'm deep like the sound of one butt cheek laughing. You just have to shut up and remember the mantra words and whisper to your friends. Yo, that motherfucker sounds deep, yo. Because I'm deeper than sense. My silence is deep. I have deep underwear and my balls get confused in them. I'm so deep, my shadow has a PhD in deepness. I'm so deep, I transcend the word transcend. I'm so deep, I make knowing none of the answers always the answer. I'm so deep, I can find the corn dog in the platinum rap single of your mind. <laughs> Damn, that's deep. <laughs> Shit, I'm the like deepest. I'm like the serpentor of deep. I embody the combined deep DNA of all the great deeps before me. I'm so deep my cock is shaped like Merlin. I'm so deep three is four. I'm so deep the wind. I'm so deep. 
regarding abandoning the veto appearance, oh wait, now notice, at this point in my history, I learned the vanity of this is not serving the way I share my work, so I began standing like this, <laughs> to be both grounded and with my core. <laughs> so, if you can notice the little body changes, gold star, gold star, gold star. <laughs> regarding a Danny DeVito appearance on The View, Rosie O'Donnell was quoted as saying, I can't believe this. This is world news. I can imagine some newscaster in China going, Ching Chong, Ching Chong, Danny DeVito, Ching Chong. When told why this was inappropriate, Rosie became defensive. Said, oh, no, 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 that was an accent. I, I do accents all the time. I do accents of everyone. In response to that, an open letter to all the Rosie O'Donnells. I don't care about being politically correct. I just want to be helpful. So there's no need to be defensive, Rosie. Ignorance is not a crime. And believe me, when it comes to accents, you are ignorant. Because Ching Chong Ching Chong is not an accent. Ching Chong Ching Chong is a racist interpretation of a language often associated with being buried alive in a mine shaft and other such hate crime fun. An accent is a vocal affectation of speech. You see, there's these things. They're called dictionaries. They tell you the meanings of words. Don't you know English? I thought from the way you looked, you did. Or perhaps you meant to say you do lots of impressions of languages. Well, in that case, Ching Chong Ching Chong is a crappy impression. I thought you were famous because you were good at what you do. I don't even know Chinese, and I can do a better impression than that. It'll do in a pinch. But that's Cantonese. Is Mandarin. You see, there's a difference, like different factions of the queer community, which is why you should listen, because I would never make fun of who you are and then make you feel wrong for trying to inform me of what I shouldn't say, whatever it is I am saying about whom you represent. So listen to me, Rosie. I know you're not evil. I don't care if you're mean. I don't care how many famous non-Asians or Asians who secretly hate themselves speak on your behalf. Because I speak on behalf of those who don't have the opportunity to address you. Who know what Ching Chong Ching Chong feels like combined with a swinging bat. So apologize, Rosie. Tap into the humanity that I know you possess. Or at least recognize that one day you're going to have to face this, and it's not going to be in the sheltered yes-men environment of a talk show. Because regardless prime time, the world you live in predominantly looks like this. So apologize, Rosie. We all make mistakes. There's always room for forgiveness. So, I'm not really known for this one yet, but I want to be. But the fact of the matter is, I hate six, but I love seven and five. So, we're going to do this one. It's uh, written by my mother as a writing device. It begins with a note, and since we're in this very private atmosphere here, I've memorized the note and often just hold up a piece of paper because sometimes people need that. And then I do this with my eyebrows. <laughs> Dear audience, my son agreed to perform this so that I, an immigrant, could have a voice. He does not understand this. He's never had to leave all that he knew and loved in order to survive. He is a tourist. He will not drink tap water. This is not for him, but this is for the Philippines. And even though I've not seen much of the world, I believe that what I have to share is relevant to many people. Thank you for listening. Forgive the translation. Yours, Elizabeth Sia. And now the poem. you thought was beneath you, importing us to build your cities, 
nanny your children, and nurse your fragile antibiotic lives. Your IKEA prices destroyed our minimum wage, and we are tired of sleeping where your waste is sent. So we coming over, and you can't do shit. Your children are too spoiled to stop the immigration problem. Our may I take your order sends dollars, pounds, euros, and yen back home. Gives our children education with computers, our uncles houses with doors, and our communities relief that beer cannot provide. The first world taught the third world how to use other countries in order to benefit the motherland. So now we gonna colonize you. From Brixton to the Bay, Sydney to Houston, Tokyo to Paris, we learns fast and we breathes faster. The generation cleaning your toilets will beget the generation doing your taxes will beget your son-in-law. We've had to adapt without a balanced diet and we are not forgetting the deaths that brought us here, so thank you for teaching us capitalism. <laughs> now let us teach you something that your salary could not. You live in a world. <laughs> You've chosen to win at the expense of someone else's loss. You've consciously allowed, which is almost the same as doing, and your most favored nation status has only gained you boredom, terrorism, and high-speed internet access. We're gonna serve the first world until you realize that we're not just here to serve you. We're gonna colonize the first world until you can't ignore us just by going click until our children stop being born as the enemy, until the first world stops seeing the third world as a different place. Oh. Oh God. I swear, if it wasn't you, I wouldn't have done half of that shit. Like have your molecules rearranged and you come back out of it like <laughs> <laughs> never. How often do you do that? Did you tell my vanity move though? I was like, oh my strand of my hair is in my forehead. I went, <laughs> I'm telling all, I'll tell you all the things I noticed, all things I show. What, what the fuck you want to know? Go. What do barbecue smurf meat taste like? <laughs> um they taste like pop culture acceptance. <laughs> well done. Very rare. <laughs> How deep do you feel right now? Deep enough to know the insignificance I possess in the universe, yet the necessity of my participation in the universe. <laughs>
taking account the human factor, the history, the context, where they're at, and stuff. Like, um, so my impression or understanding of game theory, as I apply it in my own life, is just to understand, uh, like, a basic board game, uh, like Monopoly, right? There's always going to be tendencies, and based on those tendencies and other people's um, motivations for uh, achieving their goals in the game, and people are gonna have different goals within the game, right? Someone's gonna want more money, another person's gonna want more property, another person's gonna want specific property. Everyone feels like they have their gateway to success, and I have to counter that with my own, that kind of thing. Well, well what do you, how do you find uh, poetry alive in people's agendas then? I mean, because you're, if, if, we're, if we're talking about sharing our poems. Right. Is, is that an agenda within that battlefield? It kind of sounds a little antagonistic. Which game, game, what, people sharing their poems live on stage? Well, that could be antagonistic, yeah. Well, I'm very fortunate that I've met many poets in my life and uh, around the world and stuff like that. And most of the poets that I have met are primarily those who perform on stage, or share their work on stage, rather. And um, as far as agendas go, everything a human being does um, reveals agenda. An agenda is not really a loaded word of like negative or positive. It's just like a course of action. You know, I have a set of ideas, like a list for the day. And uh, so everything they do on stage is an agenda. Even if uh, the, the agenda they profess is often betrayed by the agenda their body reveals, right? Or the agenda of what they do once they get off stage, or the agenda of what they use their poems to get them. See what I mean? So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all pretty agenda to me. So I wanted to ask you uh, questions about personal myth, like personal myth making. That's mm -hmm. part, of what I, part of the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. with my residency. But I wanted, so Alan Watts has, uh, well, all, all, everyone has ideas, right, about myth and the definition of myth. But it, maybe an old definition of myth, which we're not really using right now, is simply a symbol. You know, so myth, whether it's a story or it's a position or it's a cosmology, is a symbol um, used to figure out the world around you. A more contemporary definition of myth now is just a lie to be disproven. So I wanted to ask you to think about the personal myths that you were engaging with as an aspiring poet? Before I became known. I don't know, are you known now? Relatively. Okay, so yeah, as you were shaping yourself. At, yeah, because I think you're one of the few people that I've met in my life who was able to shape himself into an artistic idea, at least. And I've seen your ideas change over time, but mm -hmm. if you could talk to us about you know, the, the mythologies that you were dealing with as you shaped yourself as a writer. Right, uh, well, let's go stages, right? So let's go beginning stage, Oklahoma. Um, like I said before, you know, 15, uh, even my own friends, or a few I had, uh, there are certain topics I can talk to them about because of comments that I heard them say that I would laugh off growing up, which is, uh, so it's late 80s, mid 90s, Oklahoma City. And um, Oklahoma has a huge Ford plant, so around the time I was in third to sixth grade was when the fears of the Japanese auto industry take over were occurring. There's also a large military base in Oklahoma, therefore there's a lot of Vietnam War veterans and Korean War veterans, you know, a lot of uh, anti-Asian sentiment uh, among people. Uh, so th that feeling that uh, it was not okay to express certain things began how I spoke, and also the idea that uh, when you feel like you're the only one in the group, it's quite easy to have others uh, confirm each other, even if they may be sort of being unhealthy or wrong. If that makes sense. Uh, for instance, uh, if we all uh, like chocolate ice cream and the other person likes vanilla, it's very easy for the others to say, actually, no, chocolate is the best, you're crazy. You're the only one that likes vanilla. You are fucking nuts. What is wrong with you? So because of that, I started writing a lot of things that were in reaction to that. Everything that I felt rejected for, everything that I felt I was not approved of or accepted for, I uh, reacted and attacked. But I attacked on grounds that um, were not really a full expression of myself, where the self that I could um, 
share on stage because I'm still being run completely by my ego and my insecurity. And therefore, the, the, the deep, deep desire to be accepted at, at all costs, even at the cost of myself, even at the cost of my own development as a human being, just to be accepted on some level, just hear that the clapping and the laughing and shit. You know, is, is why I did this, this poem that I just haven't done in like 10 years, that financial success poem. Because you know that, that a lot of people could really safely embrace me for that. There's not a single thing in there. And, and you know, Bruce Lee has transcended. So even that is sort of a thing that we, oh, we can all agree on that. Yeah, Bruce Lee's hilarious, it's great, blah, blah, blah. You know, so that initial myth making for myself came from a huge uh, ego insecurity, desperate need for acceptance thing. And it kept going because, uh, you know, I just celebrated and, and glorified for that. And, you know, people start paying you money and say you're so hilarious or that was great. And you think, well, okay, so if they think I'm great, then I really need to keep yelling in this register. I need to keep doing it this fast. I need to keep doing it this loud. I need to keep being this intense. Oh, you're so crazy. Oh, I need to keep being crazy. Oh, you are just the angry Asian man. Oh, that's a good thing. Be the angry Asian man. God, okay. But you know, you know, then you know. But then you, um, so I, you know, I get to this point, and then I get to the point where I start meeting people Asian American writers workshop, and um, you know, they open me up to this whole other uh, uh, being uh, Asian in America experience, or Americans of Asian descent experience, and then I, I begin unleashing these other kinds of poems. Once again, it's an unfair reaction because uh, not everyone should have to. Um, be responsible for what I've experienced from others. You know? and, and not that these poems are bad or they don't have positive value or anything like that. It's more I'm speaking from the point of where I am now, looking back on it then. But I would not have done it any other way, the course of events leading me to here. Because if I hadn't experienced it, uh, I wouldn't have gotten it here. I couldn't theorize my way through this. Well, there's also the context into which you shape yourself as a writer. Right. So, so, and that's a reality. So, even coming from, I don't know what Oklahoma would have been like at that time, but so landing in New York City, particularly in the in the nineties. Like, when when did you get to New York? What year? Ninety five. Yeah. yeah. So, what would gay ninety five? <laughs> that was a good year for you too. Okay. <laughs> um. Uh, while we're talking, if you have uh, questions that you want to formulate in your mind that are not comments, that would be great. And watch me shut down comments real quick, because okay. he actually hears comments all the time, and he'll be here to hear more of your comments. But if you have a question, and also, Bo, if you have questions, not for me, for right. anyone in the audience, <laughs> for ideas about, well, you know, whatever questions you want. Yeah, it don't take it easy on me. Anyway, yeah. not you. I don't really know. You know, well, you know we're gonna to, die. But well, I also wanted to thank you before I forget to thank you for being vulnerable and honest. I, I appreciate that and I thank that and I hope and I'm sure everyone in here appreciates it as well and aspires to um, vulnerability and honesty. So I wanted to say thank you. We're sitting up here and think of formulating questions. If you thought there's something in, in your newer work uh, that deals with the myths that you're now engaging with, because it, from what it's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have something that you can read off the page that is. That I, I mean, yeah. I mean, you're no, saying you don't about, have to. No, you were asking me about the newer work that you had that prepared, and I really thought about that for a lot. And, and you know, to, to be honest, at this point, um, you know, there's a part of me that still loves being on stage. No. Because that was like, you know, the kid that needs that. What about when the camera comes on and I lose you completely? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm into all that, right? And, uh, which is great. But these days, like, my newer work is really... I, I literally consciously consider my work with language to be off stage mostly. Like, which is really weird because I don't get paid for it. It'll never be in my um, my bio and stuff. Uh, but for instance, an example would be that I tell people, uh, I get invited to a university and I go perform for an hour, which is it's a tremendous honor. 
give me money and stuff, put me in a hotel, and they take me out to dinner, and they drive me to and from the airport. And in, in that drive, that 20, 30 minutes to and from the airport, I have an opportunity to talk to someone who is at that time in their life where they're constantly bombarded by stimuli. And in that alone moment, are able to listen and are receptive to questions. And if I can accurately read where they're at in their life quickly enough, I can start bringing up things maybe for them to consider five years down the road. And I try to just, I'm not sure if I'm successful at this, it's just something that I put effort and energy into. Another example would be, uh, rather than get angry with my father because he gets so emotionally upset if my mother brings up something that he doesn't want to hear, I think about in what ways do I do that? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, no, I agree. Like, no, but I mean, I, I, I like all those ways, right? Because it gives me something to do with my life. It's like uh, if I was born perfect, life would be really boring. But this way, I have a lot of meat to work on till I die, right? So, those types of things. Um, as far as my written work and things, something I'm really working on heavily that I'm not really prepared to show in full, but I wanted to talk about was that. Uh, I'm trying to do so much more than with language. Meaning like the moment, because I see poets and performers here, it's just great, I love you guys being here. The thing is, these days, the moment I walk on stage, I'm trying to create an environment with the audience and really listen for where they're at. And it may not change my poems, but it changes the vocal inflections, the pacing. That's why I did the first two poems that way, because I didn't know to break out of that for many years. And when you hear those poems that way, and I do them that way, I now recognize the wall I create with people who are not wanting to hear them. So could you talk a little bit about the schizophrenia of that? The reality of being placed in a position, forget about the representation that you had to carry as an ancient male body mm -hmm. off the street, onto the stage, and onto the screen. So if we mm -hmm. can just we can come back to that, that there's that projection onto your body mm -hmm. and your reaction something you keep coming back to, mm -hmm. you know, writing from from reactionary space. And again, I, I go back to this concept of what world you stepped into, and that you shaped yourself onto that stage. So now what you're talking about are nuanced modalities, changing the air and energy in a room, mm -hmm. getting people to do jazz hands seriously, mm -hmm. and say, you know, like, that was amazing. All of you guys were doing this, and you thought it was metaphysically important, it was awful. It was dope. Everybody that was walking by there saw uh, a unit. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you deal with this, the gross reality of being on stage under lights and getting attention, and the subtle nuances that you're talking about of actually reaching into his, into his soul with what you're thinking, and, and having her be moved when she gets out of here. Talk to me about the balance in your life that allows you to do that without harming yourself. Right. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's better if I show. Yeah. Can I show? All right, so this is about five. I know this guy, actually. <laughs> so he's like a friendly face, right? So say he's not a friendly face, right? And uh, I never met him before. I would interpret this with this very differently. I interpret this very differently as well. So if I see this, this, head down as opposed to head up, right? And I, and I lean into him to say my fucking poem and shit, first of all, I'm not gonna come at him like this, right? I'm gonna come at him like this so he knows that I'm not giving him my full shit so he doesn't have to feel threatened. So I come across like this, and I just slowly lean just with my head, right? So he knows my weight is back here, this is over here, I'm good. And then I, and I start soft down here. I start at the heart. I don't try to approach him in his head, because I can already tell that everything's going on in his fucking head right now. So I start lower at the gut, and they go, hey man, what's up? And then I move up slowly. Then I move up to his head as I speak, right? So even though I'm on stage, and I'm trying to get him to open, and be open to him, I'm also protecting myself, and, and being aware of his boundary, right? But it's, it's a practice. So I'm not 100%, right? Because what he's doing right now, is different than if I didn't know him. It's different if you were a woman. 
right? It's different if you were from a different geography, a different background, it's from the BX, right? So it's like a whole other thing. You gotta start just chopping down lists one by one by one, and you know, my percentages are still quite low. But I, you know, by the time I die, I wanna be 60, 70, right? So, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Like, you get on, yeah, you're right, on stage you're in a very vulnerable position, so why not create a character, a persona, someone who's totally like, Oh my God! What? You want to fuck with me? I will own this stage. But then it's all me imposing upon you. What do I Post get out of that? me. Exactly. What do I get out of that? <laughs> what, what do I get out of that? What, what opens up to me in that in that scenario? You know what I'm saying? If I just dominate you, how can I really pull from your energy to get my real strength? Because this kind of power, this kind of power, this kind of power only pushes someone down or smashes them to idolize you, right? And it's very exhausting because you got people idolizing you, then how will they ever become empowered enough to uplift the world? Six billion people? I can't do that much shit in my life. <laughs> I'm only one dude. So if I'm going to go around the world and do these poems and shit, like I got to really- Dude, my neck. Get down. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Well, we had a lot of rituals that are, will remain ours. But I think one thing that I learned so much from you while we were touring and on stage with the poetry jam was you did get that applause. You yeah. did get that kind of hysterical standing ovation. Um, and when I say hysterical, I mean that it actually came from you to ride, right? Like you, you would just get delirious laughter. Um, and, I would, and I would get crickets. It was a balance. And Bo actually, I, yeah, to all of you, that was something that he taught me, was that that did, that roar of laughter, was the same thing as them not listening at all. And it's very hard, I think, especially for a man in many of our societies, to have that kind of attention night after night, and to know that it's empty to a certain extent. And to see one of your best friends night after night reach for that kind of connection. And you were very kind throughout it, and I'm glad that we had each other to learn from the opposite. Because at the end of the day, I always felt like we represented, you represented me more than anybody with my language or my religion. And I always felt like I re represented you on stage because they would shut up and listen to me while they were laughing right. when you were up there. So that sense of what power is on stage right. is just something that I want you to think about as we move forward. I'm gonna ask one, I'm gonna see if there's one question in the audience that, you know, the first brave soul that has a question, you could ask a question. What if I go already show and tell? Okay, let me, because there's someone right behind you. Hi, hi both, thank you so much. I you bring you oh, sorry. <laughs> could you say your name so everyone can meet you? Hi, my name is Rose. Hi, my name is Rose Chan. I actually um, watched you do your stuff 10 years ago. I was very depressed at the time, and you, the uteri laughing that you're talking about, I hadn't experienced such a thing as, when I saw, this is not, this is a question to you. Are you anyway, sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you were my hero at the time, and I came up to you and asked you for your autograph, and you wrote this description saying, you know, please don't die. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it, but anyways, my question is, um, I wonder what you think about heroes, just to go with the myth thing. What, what makes a hero, are you a hero? What kind of hero are you or wanna be? Who were your heroes growing up? Thank you. Thank you. Alright. Um, that was like five questions. It's all good. Sorry. Let's, <laughs> no, just, it's all let's, good. let's run the like, list. Yeah. Heroes growing up. Guys are really, for reasons beyond my control, just really just follow so intensely. For some reason I really had a good run with Charles Bukowski. Like I really followed that dude. Really I couldn't even believe it. I don't even know why to this day why I could spend so much but I did. Um, Bruce Lee, for sure. Because how could you not at that time period? You know, talking pre so many things going on now. Um, you know, other than that, you know, maybe Einstein, because I once had this shirt, we went to a swim meet, and we went to this mall, and you know, we didn't have these kinds of malls in Oklahoma back then, so we went to this novelty shop in this mall out of state, and uh, that is Einstein shirt that said, uh, 
imagination is more important than knowledge. I, I wore that all through high school, even though I never read Einstein's theories until I got out of high school, you know? But that shit really moved me. Like, I really, that fixates in my mind all the time. That's really basically that. But, um, you know, since then, nobody. Like, you know, I'm not really, like, I'm just not the, the type to be into uh, the hero thing. I don't know why. Maybe I'm a hater. You know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of people say, say that, you know? Like, sometimes, like, I meet really phenomenal people, right? Like, Suhair, I could consider her a hero. Some of the people in this room, I could consider my heroes. But more importantly, I consider them phenomenal examples of human beings that I can, uh, in the parts in which I'm not as developed, can strive through their example to get there. Um, do I believe that people need heroes or things like that? Um, my problem is most people associate hero with saving the day and uh, helping the world, doing things that others could not do or cannot do. And I'm not really into that. I'm, and I, I read so many comic books growing up, so I really pretty thorough with the comic book knowledge, especially on the Marvel side of things. <laughs> um, so, I'm not... Um, but it sounds like you feel like um, you're, you're in this position to speak for people who can't. Yeah, that is definitely not a question. Okay. No, but... Okay, we're gonna get the mic to somebody else, and you can, you can comment. You can comment I'll on remember that. that. Yeah. No, you can comment on it, but they're going to take the mic to another Yeah, okay, so while you're moving the mic around, I will say to you that, um, yeah, but these days, about 50% of my shows, I remember to say, don't let me be your voice. Let this be an example of how you can be who you are, all of you. That's why I do some of my most unpopular work in hour-long shows these days. And I tell them straight up, you may not love me, but you will know me by the end of this. And may it be something that encourages you to be all of who you are. Thank you. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Are you all just awestruck? Why, though? You're a hero. I'd be like burping and farting and shit. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, we were going to talk a little bit more about the body, yeah. and then you got up and did that thing. Yeah, let's talk that about the awesome. body, sure. Yeah, so... Um, How much body work do I do? A lot. What kind? Mine. <laughs> also portraying in MMA and Shaolin Kung Fu. <laughs> and I also do, uh, uh, I guess I could call it Tong Jitsu or something. It's like a knife fighting technique. Um, and then I, take, I do my own dance class because I used to be boy. And I can't stand to have these young motherfuckers think they can dance better than me. But you never talk about your body unless you're talking about penises and pets. Say them? <laughs> really? No, you just want to say it again. Say it again. I know. No. You said penis. That's exactly. The only word I heard. You just said it again. <laughs> so what's, what's I, know, what else? I, I know how you're doing this. But what about the rest of the Asian male body? What about it? What about it? It's I, fucking phenomenal. What what is what is it? <laughs> My ability to generate and process chi has been developed over thousands of years. What? <laughs> RNA, motherfucker. What do you want me to say? I want you to talk about the fact that it's missing from your page often, still. Oh. And so you, you actually just had to carry so many different forms of study about the body. And everything right. that you do that you've had to learn right. about delivering your thoughts and your emotions it right. has been through this body. Right. And yet, and I, I think, I probably haven't read everything you've written, but I guarantee I've read as much as everybody here from your work. Mm -hmm. And the body is missing. Mm. No, I agree. Like you a can lot think of, about it, but I'm No, no, sorry. totally. A lot of the word sequence is very intellectual, which is why I just had to go into folk music and why I just racked up tons of debt not making money for the last six years. So, you know, I mean, I went into this place where I felt like the words didn't articulate who I was fully because it only reflected my intellectual mind. So I started writing and singing folk songs. And goddamn, they're, they're garbage. But like, I love the feeling of notes vibrating through my system and the healing it provides me. So I love the songs more than some of my most famous poems because those 
What I learned from those was not in reciting the poem, but in my experience with others reacting to the poem. But what I learned from playing and singing my songs is in the process of me playing and singing my songs. So that's the actual experience. The physical experience of dropping down, bringing the air from down there, feeling all the pockets, letting it vibrate from a place that isn't stressed but is big. And then did you bring those, or did you bring that education back to the stage? Mm -hmm. and, and to your poems for, for a new way of delivering them? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I did the, the fast and the slow pacing and stuff, and the idea that you don't have to yell to be powerful or engaging. You gotta learn how to like uh, bring the body into focus without having to like just yell at a tremendous pace. Um, so yeah, all of those things help a lot because besides breath control, there are frequencies that people respond to. That's why the first two poems were so edgy because I purposefully elevated my register to reflect what I was using at 19. It was actually very painful and could have been eventually terribly damaging to my throat had I continued, but that's why I stopped for those six years to be like, hey, I may be getting money for this, but I am fucking up my life. Do you have any questions? Do you guys, y'all are scared, I'm gonna shut down the comments. Can you say your name so everyone can meet you? Hi, I'm Karina. Hey, Bob. Hey, what's up? Could you talk a little bit with regard to your development or transformation, like what you just said about um, making money but fucking yourself up? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, quite honest, sometimes I just kick myself that I didn't write the I Am Asian American One Man Show. I could have fucking killed that shit and made millions of dollars and I did it. And I could have gone to Shanghai, and Beijing, and Australia, and Paris. I know you like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you it yourself as you're discussing this. Yeah, because I, I didn't What know show are you talking about? Because I know how to capitalize and push funds to get people to love me without being me. Like, I know how to do that. And I have to every day choose not to do that. And it fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so why? Yeah. Why? Because... I tasted a power greater. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, Ooh, yeah, yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, right. Who oh, God is in the house? <laughs> so, <laughs> here's the thing. Okay. How much money you gonna make? Here's the thing, right? I know, I know some some millionaires. That has not helped them at all. I know some other millionaires, and some of the work they've done has tremendously allowed that currency to be elevated beyond a stock market value. But the, the, to your question, how much of it was the outside, how much of it was the inside? <clears throat> a lot of it was getting grinded out by the outside never satisfying. So I kept chasing, 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 thinking if I just had this little bit more, if I just got to this point, if I just had this series of things, I would feel a certain way. And I never did. And after falling down like 30 to 50,000 times, I was like, obviously, like Einstein says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So I, I had to change. And uh, I started beginning the work by noticing that uh, if I am in only the most powerful part of my system, I still neglect the rest of my system. And a big thing that happened to me was I tore my ACL. When I tore my ACL, I went to see my therapist. And he walked me through, he's an emotional physical therapist. And I was like, you know, it's totally a bummer. You know, you're never gonna be the same again, your knee and all this shit. But you know what? You've been your whole life using 100% of your knee. I'm gonna teach you to use 10% of every part of your body and you will be much stronger than you ever were. I started applying that into every aspect of my life. I thought, well, if I put my whole entire being into this, will it therefore have a much greater effect than if I utilize the part I've been most, uh, that I've been told to exercise the most, so to speak. But does that make sense? It's like uh, the difference between a guy who bench presses 300 and a person who fucking practices yoga three times a week is a very different type of strength and power. One is far more impressive initially, but its flexibility and application is very limited. And I didn't want to have that. 
I wanted something that applied whether we entered utopia or Armageddon, whether I was at the best of myself or the worst of myself, that I had a balancing machine that incorporated all of the, uh, all those in my possession, right? Like, I didn't want to pretend like I had, I didn't have two arms. <laughs> They're important the way I use my hands. But it's also, it's dizzying. What's dizzying? What's dizzying is the, those decisions, making those decisions, having, uh, you know, a dominant narrative that says success looks like this. Right. And success looks like this for you, especially. And right. anyone who looks like it. So there's that, it's interesting, if there is an outside or an inside to that kind of pressure, I'm not sure. Because I think so many times you think you've gotten away from reacting to your parents' blueprint for who you're supposed to be or mm -hmm. to your banker's blueprint. You've just been kind of reacting most of your 20s into your 30s. Not you. No, 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 definitely me. Know. Definitely me. Big time reaction guy, which is why uh, I decided to change engines. I literally said, you know what? This engine sucks. Because the minute this engine doesn't have a fucking monster to fight and destroy, it fucking fails. So I need an engine that motivates itself. Oh, so an engine that gives birth to itself. Well, you know, like, I'm kind great of. I'm great if there's a, a dragon to slay. But if there's no dragon, can I still build a better world? I'm not even going to get into that myth. Okay. St. George's dragon slaying myth from research. First of all, is there something fuck like the Western world, Asians. <laughs> Not, yeah. All I'm saying is dragons came from Asia, son! <laughs> Period! You're right, I'm, not, I'm done. I was gonna actually wear a dragon shirt, and then I thought it would be like obvious. <laughs> We're always obvious. I know. We look deep in the... Hi. Yes. Um, What's your name? Susan. Sorry. When you perform the same pieces over and over and over again, how do you keep it organic and fresh for you? Right. <laughs> Well, um, people go, come up to me a lot and say, uh, oh my god, I love your work. Uh, I'm sure you hear this all the time. I say, um, you know what? But I've never heard it from you. And that's kind of how I try to do with my performances these days. I literally recognize that every performance I do is its own set of unguaranteed, unpredictable circumstances. I had no idea about this setup. I had no idea how to play this room. Half the time I was performing, I was overtly aware that my position alienated this third of the room. But then I had to stick to the guns of the first half of poems, I didn't have that kind of body awareness in my performance. So, you know, those kinds of things. I just literally acknowledged, you know, in this room, right? The percentage of friendly faces to maybe open faces to closed off faces to uh, testing faces. You know, like that percentage fluctuates in any given room and that allows live performance to be any number of things, but you have to listen for them which is another thing that has really vastly improved my work in six years, my ability to listen. Like I said, the imposing thing only works at such a level. To, to reach the highest state, you actually have to become a tremendously involved listener. So that helps all the time, listening. I guess. That would be impossible. Don't we want to talk about the shit? We are talking. So what do you want to do? What do you want me to do? You want me to do the, the poem I've only done three times because it's so intense, but it's 15 minutes? You want me to do this shit about a knife? You want to do um, this thing, Glory? How much time do we have? I don't know what time it is. Which one do you want to do? Why do you look, that's, that's the answer to the question. Which one do you want to do? Let's do this, it's 15 minutes. Then you good. I don't even give a shit about YouTube. It's like, who is this asshole that does not give a shit about Twitter or YouTube? It's crazy. You just do 15 minute poems, just like, crazy. So anyone who's not archiving this and stuff, like, I mean, you're good dude, JD. But like, anybody else is gonna try to videotape this, don't, because this is the kind of thing totally gets taken out of context, for sure. It's called growing into monsterhood. <clears throat> um, oh. One. My name is Cho Sung Kui, and I embody more tragedies than the segments between commercials. 
The documentation of my actions has been a path to the end and not the beginning. All the safe words have been used to convey the danger in me. I have been turned into a symbol against my will. I am at the mercy of interest groups, lobbyists, governments, and you probably know more about me than you're comfortable with. Perhaps if I happened in Vegas, I'd have stayed there. Unfortunately, my parents could only leave home forever once. And in death, I have finally won the popularity contest no reality show would give me the opportunity to compete in. In death, they speak of me. In death, I have ceased to be dismissed. In death, my expose is more thorough than Asian Pacific American Heritage Month everywhere. I did not choose this, even though I got what I thought I wanted. I held back a lifetime of reactions for one moment. I was as oblivious of my impact as others have been to their own, and I would rather have been alive for this. I'd rather the circumstances were different. I've heard politicians say similar things on TV. If I'd known on campus what I do now, well, maybe you don't want to hear the ifs. It can make judgment difficult. I'm so tired of the way my name sounds in the voices of others. I fantasized recognition and justified myself with blame. Now I've become the blame, and all I want to do is tell you who I am with my own tongue. It's funny that you are tuning in now that I can no longer speak. A moment made from a lifetime, and it has left us all lacking. Someone high above us all, where the poorest concepts can't reach, needed to spin me into a story greater than my own. I've always found deadline to be a tragic word. What words would I have omitted to receive forgiveness? What words will be omitted to deny me it? What actions will become the mythology of my life? Will it be edited as well as the mythology I used to murder the innocent? How will this mythology grow in the mouths of storytellers who can barely pronounce my name? Two, my name is Cho Sung Hui. My family name precedes me, as I was already born with history. Have you ever learned another language at gunpoint? Have you ever been considered inhuman at the hands of your rapists? Have you ever had to choose which nation you wished to occupy you more? Have you ever been divided by other countries? Have you ever been reduced to a strategic position? Have you ever known death by embargo? Have you ever worshipped the God whose image you're not made in because you witnessed the eyes of God wearing a treaty on his neck, absolving him of sin he judges you for considering? These are just bullet points. None of us have patience for the narrative anymore. My parents did not have the time to give me more. There is a price to cheap goods and labor. My parents did not have the will to recall more. Even they are taught that none of it happened. They don't have the budget for the truth. I believe this information is in the public domain. What will I help sell that I've not agreed to? What will my likeness and image become in the war room? Do they know me or only how to use me? Three, my name is Cho Sung Hui. I was born in Toledo, Ohio, the son of Chinese immigrants from the Philippines. College educated, they've never been able to work in the profession they've chosen. The long hours are spent to prevent being fired, not to advance. No one is prejudiced, and no skill acquired warrants promotion. No one is prejudiced, and we don't know our neighbors. I'm taught not to rock the boat. I'm taught to be twice as good as anyone white to get the same. My sisters and I learn to be punchlines, as well as representatives of a continent. No one is prejudiced, and 
even my perfect speech is strange. No one is prejudiced, and I am the Japanese auto industry of the 80s. No one is prejudiced, and I have sold secrets that threaten national security. The image of me on television looks like hundreds of years of self-hate set to a laugh track. I'm shown white men portraying my father. I'm given my identity in the 10 seconds it takes to fulfill a joke or death. My sisters get fucked, then left for someone blonde like our classmates. We have cable to babysit us, so our parents can afford to reduce the number of reasons we feel inferior. Neither they nor my siblings and I possess the bridge to communicate this to one another. Social programs do not exist for those who have language used against them at work. I don't know we're barely eating and resent the Cool Whip container holding my lunch because I'm already playing alone. Already the school appointed authority on a culture I'm simultaneously shown in every textbook as meaning nothing here. Already the son of the Viet Cong who've been mythologized as the destroyers of uncles. Asian is one color on the map for reasons that elude me for years. What I learned in school does not stop this feeling from growing regardless my GPA. I react. I begin to question those who mock me with a language neither of us know. I haven't reached puberty. And I've been told not to be so sensitive more times than days I'm alive. My body lacks visible scars, never broken a bone. They replace civil rights footage every February. It's like I have no proof. No one is prejudiced, and none of it ever happened. The past exists only as a footnote. By junior high, I know every ethnic slur. I'm taught what's possible for me, and it seems limiting. I look up stereotype in history, and small dicks as Side, I'm told all of mine are positive. Other Asian children enter this reality, not fortunate enough to speak English as a first language or possess a French first name. I don't know why I distance myself from them. I just don't want to be seen as them. No one is prejudiced, and I am learning well. There are manuals for fitting in but not for understanding the unknown. I start to run. I start to run from this feeling. I start to run from what I believe is outside me. I've left my sisters out of this narrative. The family members granted passage through wait list and lottery. Parents afraid of inheritance they don't want their children burdened with. Because I don't have the time for reminders of what I am. Do I really love them? I hate myself. And I keep running. I begin to achieve in ways I see rewarded all around me. Occasionally, the neo-Nazis harass me. How do I explain that we're both living where we came from? The United States of America, where I forget the chant, but you know it. All my friends are white. It's hard to tell why I make them laugh. All my teachers are white. It's hard to tell what I'm doing wrong. All the girls I crush are white. I'm not sure anymore what qualities I was attracted to. I must be invisible, because the greeter at Walmart doesn't greet me. The patrons at the bowling alley look away as I walk by, and all the salespeople in all the malls wait for me to make my presence known. There are no attack dogs in my history. None of it ever happened. I cannot run fast enough. No one is prejudiced, so I keep running to them. What's unspoken does not exist. The jokes reveal nothing, and the guidance counselor is concerned if I'm assimilating properly. I rebel against my parents for struggling to prevent me from suffering. I dress the part, costume a mix of pay attention to me and defiance, conscious to eliminate any trace of martial arts. My music lacks gongs. My interests do not have a Chinese translation. My meals look like a fast food commercial. I dismiss the occupations placed on me and find myself consumed by the art's expression. The relationship between myself and the writing does not judge, even as those in my life rejected the work for reasons still unknown to me. We need no explanations, only results. No 
hanging on my neck like a hopeless war, and only I know it's there. Is it in my mind? Am I blowing things out of proportion? Am I taking things too seriously? Does any of this matter? For my name is Cho Sung Hui. My first poems glorified suicide. My second poems glorified death. My third poems entertained killing those who acted as if I didn't exist or matter. I was suspended for drawing a pencil across the neck of my art teacher, saying jokingly, if that had been a knife, you'd be dead by now. These are just bullet points. We don't have time for the narrative. Thank you, Mark Parker, for reading everything I wrote with love. Thank you, Mom, for sticking up for me in the principal's office, in English, of course. Thank you, Dad, for taking the time you didn't have to build things for us you couldn't afford to buy. Thank you, sisters, for making me feel important when everything said that we weren't. Thank you, Medina's Coffee House. I felt more alone than I ever let on. I was falling apart in ways I didn't know how to share. I've been so close to the edge so many times. And even if you didn't notice or understand, at least you listen. Thank you, good. Okay. That was awesome. Thanks. Thank you.